So we are going to get, uh, we are going to jump back in to our series in Ruth. Um, so last week, let's just a quick refresher. Ruth gives us a freedom and an understanding that we can have a theology of pain. We can understand that life is full of pain. There is hurts. There is losses. There's unexpected and predictable pains in this life. So Ruth allows us to, to kind of know that. Here's how we know. So Ruth starts out with a story of Naomi and her husband, Elimelech. Say that 10 times fast. Um, so Ruth and, uh, or Naomi and Elimelech. Elimelech dies, so does Mahon and his son Killian. And after they die, Ruth, they have, they have moved from Bethlehem to Moab. Ruth is from Moab. She's a Moabite. So she is not of the people of Israel. And she returns home with Naomi, whose life has become increasingly bitter, as you can imagine, the death of her two sons, the loss of her husband, and no way to support or care for herself. Life has gotten really hard. But in the midst of that pain, we see God is at work. And so we're going to unpack today, kind of stepping off the, the growing point of this understanding of pain. We're going to lean in and wrestle with life when there's been famine and heartache. And now we're going to look at what happens when the harvests come. Famine is a time of want and great pain and hunger. And harvests are times of plenty. Harvests are Thanksgiving, right? Where you just put on the stretchy pants, you're like, watch what I can do to a bird, and you just go after it. Uh, it's, it's what harvest is about. So we're going to wrestle with the kind of juxtaposition of famine and heartache with the realities of a coming harvest. The end of chapter one in Ruth ends like this. Naomi and Ruth return to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley and the wheat harvest. So we understand the harvest is coming. The famine is over. Now, let me just ask this to maybe give a little modern context to it. Anybody here ever wait too long to go grocery shopping? And yeah, everybody giggles because your kids get up and like, what'd you have for breakfast? Um, you know, ice water and ice cubes, soup or cereal. There's nothing. There's ketchup, mustard, and ice water. I'm ruined. I'm starved. How could you wait this long, Mom? Mom goes grocery shopping, or maybe Dad does, which is terribly irresponsible for me. I'm just like, sausage it is. But um, so you, you go grocery shopping, and you come home, and the kids are like eating dino nugget tacos in the kitchen. It's a miracle. And they're just eating everything. Why? Because they're so excited, because where there once was want, there is now plenty. If you've ever waited too long to go grocery shopping, we know that that's an uncomfortable reality. But in famine in the ancient world, it is an impoverished brutality. There is no social umbrella for that. So we're going to talk today about harvests. We're going to read what God had planned for the harvest and how God made room for people beyond the normal margins. God made room for people in his land for people who do not belong, and uh, we would call them aliens or immigrants, and for the poor. So I want to read this with you. We're not going to go to Ruth first. We're going to start in the book of Leviticus, which the book of Leviticus is a really a book filled with the ordinances and laws of God. Check this scripture out. God says to Moses to write in the law, when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest Leave them for the poor and for the foreigner residing among you. I am the Lord your God. So Ruth comes to the Holy Land with Naomi moving back to Bethlehem, and she is a foreigner in a foreign land. And there is a, a place for her to get food when they reap the harvest. And Ruth came home with Naomi at the beginning of the barley harvest. We're going to read a pretty good chunk of scripture, and then we're going to unpack it. It's Ruth chapter 2. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth, the Moabite, foreigner, said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. Remember how he ended last week? The Lord be with you. That's what he says to them, and they reply, the Lord bless you, they answer. Boaz the asked the overseer of the harvesters, 
what is that, who does that young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvester. A sheave, remember, it's those little kind of, it's a stalk, of a bunch of grain, and they bind it together in the middle so it stands in the field. She's gleaning among the sheaves. She came into the field, and she has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in any other field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. We'll talk about that briefly in a minute. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the jars that the men have filled. At this, Ruth bowed down with her face to the ground, and she asked him, Why have I found such favor in your eyes that you would notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I have been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, how you left your father and your mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. I have to stop right there. Does anybody here, you may not, and it's okay, it's not judging, but no, Psalm 91. In the, um, for those who dwell in the shadow of the Almighty, they shall dwell in the shelter of the Most High, under whose wings they will find refuge. Do you know who wrote that? Ruth's great, great, great grandson, David. Do you wonder if maybe he found that language of finding covering under the wings of God from his own grandfather? I don't know. I just, I love scripture, interpret scripture. It's just kind of a cool thing, but maybe not to you, judging your expressions, but I super liked it. And I'm talking, so I'll do that. All right. Um, so may I continue to find favor in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. I'm a foreigner is what she's saying. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, come over here, have some bread, and dip it in the wine vinegar. When she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted, and she had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men, let her gather among the sheaves, so pulling grain out from in there, and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some of the stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up, and do not rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she thrashed the barley that she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah. Or well, we'll forget that word. I can't say it, but I know it means 30 pounds, approximately 30 pounds. She carried it back to town. Her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered, and Ruth also brought out and gave her what she had left over when she had eaten her fill. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. And Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The man that I worked uh, with today is Boaz, she said. And, she, and Naomi said, the Lord bless him, she said to her daughter-in-law. He has not shot, stopped showing kindness to the living and to the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian or kinsman redeemers. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they are finish, finished harvesting harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it would be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in someone else's field you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and the wheat harvests were finished. And she lived with her mother-in-law. I just want to touch on a couple of things. First of all, when she says, um, it'd be good for you to work with um, work with them and be in that field because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Nowadays we have what's called human trafficking, right? It's the oldest of professions when it's, when it's chosen and it's the oldest of enslavements when it's forced on someone. And, and Ruth would have been the most vulnerable candidate 
for a man's advances, unwanted advances, and she would have had no ally to defend her. She would have no one who would have protected her. So to go and be in those fields was a great risk for her physically. That should give you an idea of how hungry she was. This wasn't a quick trip to McDonald's. This was risking her physical, emotional stability and safety to go glean alone in the fields of men who had no restraint because she was a foreigner and worth nothing until what? Until Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, steps in and takes part in her story. So that's a big kind of indicator of how serious her life had become. There's also this idea that Ruth, back a little earlier in this, Ruth is, um, she gets up and she goes and she, she gleans. And she does this. Remember Leviticus 22, 23, 22, where it says the Lord speaks that they shall provide margins for people in their life. It's like you and I going to the grocery store, buying everything, and then everything on the outside of our cart we leave sitting in a pile in the parking lot for those who don't have money. That would be the equivalent. So we understand that God has made an allowance for this, but Boaz goes above and beyond it. And there's this harvest season going on, but we need to recognize, and this is really important, that Ruth is actively engaged in her new life. She is actively engaged in her new life. So let's just jump to a quick current context. Sometimes we Christians need to pack up our excuses and stow them away because we want to make excuses for our inactivity about becoming active. There's no excuse for Christians to be inactive in their life. We are called to a life of active participation with the God who redeemed us in Christ Jesus and called us to participate with him by his spirit. We need, as Christians, to pack up the excuses for our inactivity and become active in our new life in Christ. There is no excuse for us to sit back and say, well, God really hasn't spoken to me. Yes, he has. He's spoken very clearly on what we are to do and be in this life, and we'll unpack that just a little bit as we go forward. But we recognize that Ruth was actively engaged in her new life. And I will tell you this, it wasn't a life she had planned wanted or chosen. She had lost her husband, her future, lost her homeland. Now she was living as a vulnerable foreigner with a woman who couldn't provide for her. She was her older mother-in-law and she's just kind of going, I'll make the best of it. I'll get up and I'll go to work. Let me ask you this. Anybody here hate Mondays? Oh, wow. Amen. All right. So here we are. Mondays are tough, right? Because we have to do Monday. I am not a morning person. I'm more of a 1 p.m. guy, right? I could stay up till 3 a.m. every night and sleep till noon, and all my Dutch farmer friends just would, ah! I know, I know, I'm a pagan or whatever. I just don't like mornings. I think they're evil. I don't like the way I feel. I feel sad inside. Coffee makes it a little better, but not much. I, I'm just not a morning person. But I recognize in this that Ruth's, Ruth's active engagement in her life didn't let her play to her preferences, she had to do something. She had to get engaged. She had to, she had to move forward with the life she was living. She couldn't sit back and make excuses or she would starve to death in the process. And for her, the reality is that she worked her tail off this day for 30 pounds of flour. Sometimes, like a teenager, your mom gives you five bucks, I need you to go buy flour. Come on, mom, I have so many plans. And you go buy a thing of flour, Right? Imagine how Ruth got it. She started not in the grain fields unharvested, but in the scattered little pickup area. It's like picking up Legos, the little ones. She's just picking up as much as she can. And then she takes and she threshes that grain. And threshing is the part where you separate the kernel from the husk. So you beat it on the ground and then you take it and you throw it up in the air. The kernels are heavier, they fall, the chaff blows away in the wind. She got 30 pounds of grain that way. Don't ever complain about having to go get flour again, right? She did this the hard way. Not only did she work all day in the Middle Eastern sun, not the Michigan sun with a gray gray sky. This was the beating down hot sun. Her life was rough. She was vulnerable. She was exposed. And God met her in her activity. In her activity is where God really came alongside her. And we find the second part of this story is Boaz. Boaz is an estate owner. He's clearly older. He's single. He's the bachelor of Bethlehem. Would you take this, Rose? Like, that's him, okay? 
Oh, too many people laughed. You shouldn't watch that show. It's Baki. All right. That's just a side note, but boo. All right. Um, Boaz was an estate owner, and Boaz was a man of influence, but he didn't just manage his farm. He understood to run his estate. He knew how to roll the old robe up, you know, and get to work. He knew how to get work done, and he employed people to do it as well, but he was actively engaged in his normal life. So if you're like, Eric, my life's not that extreme. I'm not a Ruth or Naomi. I just want to chill a little. You know what? Fine. Boaz was a normal, everyday guy. And what happened? He got invested and involved in his estate, in his working, and God met him in the middle of that activity. He, he got to work, and he pulled himself up and gets to work. So he's at work when God meets him in his activity. And what I think we need to do is understand that being engaged in a new life feels different. And we have a lot of definitions, and I would say misdefinitions, of what new life is in Christ. Oswald Chambers says it this way. We fail because we are ignorant of the way that God has made us. We blame things on the devil that are actually the result of our own undisciplined nature. He just acquitted the devil and called us lazy. But it's kind of true, isn't it? We blame things on the devil that are actually the result of our own undisciplined nature. Just think of what could be when we are awakened with the truth. I see that quote in the story of Boaz and Ruth. They are awakened to their realities. Like it or not, they're at work. And they're busy doing the things that God gave them the opportunity to do, for better or for worse. And God gets involved. We need to stop being people who make excuses for doing nothing with the gifts God has given us. And so we need to learn to lean, lean in and understand that part of this story happens with the resident effects of painful, like, famine. Famine is a season of want. I've said that before. But here's the deal. When you, when you have seen people starve to death in your community and harvest comes, it's a party. There's hope. There's food again. But what do you do? Immediately, you take food and you put it in the barn, don't you? Because you've seen tough days, so let's save a little up. Let's not use it all. But what does Boaz do? Boaz leans into a different idea. He doesn't have a famine mentality. He leans into generosity. And generosity is a spiritual discipline. And I think the reality is that Boaz, being freshly acquainted with the ravages and pain and grinding hurt of starvation, is sitting in a community where he could take all the he could pay the, the employees their wages and store all the grain in the barn so he doesn't go hungry. But what does he do? He gathers them for a meal. And then what does he do? He invites the lowest level of society to the table and sits her next to him. He says, sit with me, have some bread, have some vinegar, and just be by me for a minute. And we recognize that generosity is a discipline of a spiritual orientation. It is a spiritual discipline to be generous. We don't talk about money in the foundry a lot. We just don't. But I'm going to lean into it for a second. And if you're a visitor and you're like, whoa, he talks about money, stay for a year or two. You'll find out we just don't. We don't talk about it. But here's the reality. Generosity on a biblical level, on a giving level, is a spiritual discipline. And it's painful and it hurts. And I think one of the reasons it hurts is by asking this question. It'll expose it. What owns you? What owns me? If I have financial issues, it's all I think about, right? But if you have a lot, we want to hoard it, don't we? We want to save up for a rainy day when the skies are clear. We don't want to be generous, but I believe this. One of the reasons we're uncomfortable talking about generosity is because where it holds on to us is in our heart. We have such an emotional reaction to someone wanting money that we're like, oh man, and we push back. Why? Because it owns our heart. It has a hold on our heart, so we feel it very acutely. And I want to speak into that today and say generosity is part of the Christian life and we don't apologize for it. We do not apologize for the fact that where there is an idol, we'll name it and we do the best to extract it. We extract the idol from our life. Have you ever met a miser? 
someone who's really tight-fisted and they have tons of money and they're kind of a jerk? Somebody's like, I'm sitting next to him, I can't, but I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> yeah, right? Okay, but seriously, a miser, someone who is so tight-fisted, Scrooge McDuck, you know, has tons of money but just won't give. It's all for me and they hold it in. Have you ever met a bitter, generous person? Think about that. Have you ever met someone who is just so weirdly generous and they're not literally alive and joyful and engaging and they're not like mine, you know? No, they're like this and they welcome you to their life constantly. They welcome you. When we as Christians understand the discipline, spiritual discipline of generosity, all of a sudden our lives become open and we quit worrying about what's ours and we start living with what was always his. And we need to understand that Boaz got this really well. And we as a, as a church must get it as well. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. So here's what I want to do. I want to look at a season of much. In this text, in Ruth chapter 3, we find Ruth has gone to Boaz. She's officially begun the flirting process with the bachelor, to be honest. I mean, that's what happens. You can listen on as I read. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and he was in good spirits, he went over to lay down at the far end of a grain pile. Let me just ask, you know what happened there, don't you? Boaz had quite a bit to drink, and he went and slept on a grain pile. No? Nobody else gets a euphemism? Okay. So, um, so Boaz staggered to the grain pile, and Ruth approaches him quietly, and she uncovers his feet and lays down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. I don't know, he had the spins. And he jumps, and he turns, and there's a woman lying at his feet. And he says... Who are you? This is super awkward. And she says, I am your servant, Ruth. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are the kinsman or guardian redeemer of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after younger men. So he was older. He was a little bit older. And whether they were rich or poor, and now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do for you anything you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. We have to wrestle with life at the end of the grain pile. We have to wrestle with the reality and the um, kind of stark realiza realization that when Boaz had everything that they wanted, they had eaten their fill, they had drank their fill, they were thankful, excited, and asleep on the heap of grain that they had just harvested. What happens? But Ruth's character takes hold of him. His kindness, when he could have had a famine mentality, revealed that he was a man of kind, godly, generous character. And her character revealed to Boaz in leaving all she had to risk it all just to be loyal to someone who could never repay her, said to him, this is a woman worth having. I want you to think with me. He is the most eligible bachelor in Bethlehem. He's not married to one woman who is of Israelite descent. And he doesn't choose any of them. He chooses the lowest foreigner on the totem pole. Why? Because character emerged. She had character. Don't ever tell me that Christian character doesn't matter. It is the evidence we give in the way that we live to the world around us of who is king of our life. Who is king of our life? Christian character matters. And we see it first right here in the character of Ruth and of Boaz. At the end of the grain pile, there is this, this, like this kind of cute romantic interplay where she says, will you take care of me? W will you care for me? I, I don't want to do this life alone. And, and with his abundance, he's already showed he'll give her anything, and then he gives it to her again. There is nothing I will hold back from you. You are mine. I take you. I will do all that you ask. When we look at how God's playing this relationship off itself, we recognize that there is something really beautiful going on for our calling in life and ministry. We live at the end of the grain pile in America. I'm not saying everybody is full, but most people are. Most of us live full up. Life is pretty good. And we are constantly at the end of a grain pile where life is just going pretty well. But the reality is, I would say this, that our money, 
our comfort and our pleasures have stolen our hearts from the Lord Jesus Christ. And we serve that far more than we serve him. And our character is seen in that which we make time for and that which we love and that which we cherish. And I would tell you this, you, like me, love far too many things in this world that will end up in a, in a landfill in 50 years. So we have to wrestle with the fact, what is our Christian character displaying to this world? It may feel a little unsettling to hear that we are idolatrous with some things, but the reality is we need to. Because those kind of shocking news bulletins hurt, but there's not like there's not a way out. My daughter this morning, Isabella, um, we were talking and she said, Dad, you look like a blueberry today. I was like, the, the round ones? Like, do I, like, could you be more informative? Like, I was pretty shocked by this. She said, no, your shorts are the color of the inside, and, and, your, and your shirt's the color of a blueberry. I'm like, but shaped more like a string bean? Yes, Dad, yes, you vain, sad man. That was the look on her face. But she said that to me, but when she said it, it felt kind of painful. You look like a blueberry. I knew it. It's because I love donuts. Like, it's... It's the way I was kind of responding. But the news actually wasn't that bad. And I want to say this to you. What owns your heart today doesn't have to the minute you leave here. You can give back to God what is his, your heart. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Live like it. Live like it. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pursue Christian character and really apply this in three ways. And um, I would say it hurts a little, but it's worth it. Generosity. Oh, sorry. Generosity is not someone else's job. And I, and, and I think this is, this is kind of hard, but it, it speaks into the realities of where we're at. If this is your home, if the foundry is your church home, you live under the high calling of the tithe. What is the tithe? It's the first 10% of everything. What is the first 10%? The payment on a sweet truck. A really, really legit vacation for the whole family where you get the Disney dining plan too. It's a lot for most of us. 10% of what you make, some of you are like, not going to happen, Pastor Eric. It's not going to happen. Why? Because we are owned by things. Why does God have the tithe? Why does God have the gleaning? Why does God do that? Because he knows what we're most fallible in. We will hold on to the things of this life. And I will tell you this. The wealthy man goes to the same grave that the poor man does, and they take none of it with them. What do we take but the Lord Jesus Christ? Generosity pops out of our heart, the idol of money. And I will tell you this, if you want to give your money elsewhere, that's fine. That's fine. But if this is your church home, we are inviting you to live generously and participate in the vision of the foundry by sharing your time, your talents, and your treasure without hiccup or hesitation to live faithfully into God's calling and not be owned by the things of this world. We have a hard enough time being faithful in some of the big, in little things. This big one would set a lot of things in line. Remember the story of the miser and the generous person? A lot of Christians sit like this and go, no, 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 I can't give God 10%. God doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. He doesn't need your money. He wants your heart. Dislodge from it the very thing that battles for your soul. And quite often, it's money. It's generosity. So here's what we do. We don't pass an offering plate. We don't want to put something in front of you that makes you go like, oh my gosh, I've got to put something in there or that guy's judging me. Like, we don't want that. There's two giving boxes. We put lamps over them to make them more distinguishable. Um, but there's two giving boxes. And this is a spiritual discipline between you and your Lord and Savior. And we invite you to put God's tithe and your offering into there so that the vision of this church to reach the unchurched, the dechurched, and transform the overchurched into a missional body that understands the kingdom is coming alive here first and living its way out. I get super excited when I think of a church unowned by money. I get really excited when I think of my life unowned by money. We have to be people who are generous to a fault and find that the joy of Christian life is found in not being owned by two masters, and we serve but one, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Next thing. Um, stop pretending that there's reasons to do nothing. Find where God's at work and get up and join him in it. Think of Ruth. Actively engage in your life. Actively engage in your life. 
We have this problem in Western culture. Back in the 1400s in England, the word priority came into being. Priority came into being. It was singular, and it was singular until 1900 when we kind of spun it and we created priorities. Let me tell you something. There cannot be more than one first in your life. We do not have a series of firsts. That's little league t-ball. Everybody gets a ribbon, but that's not Christian life. We have but one priority, and it is growing into the image of Christ, and we find where God's at work, and we work with him in his kingdom to come. So a few ways you can do that here is a thing called stakeholders. And if you've got your connection card and you're like, okay, what is sticky church? It sounds kind of bocky, um, but still, it's, it's good. And it's our vision to how to grow, but grow small. Grow with intimate connections to our family. Right on the back of your connection card, stakeholders with a question mark. I'll call you this week. I'll explain it to you. Maybe if there's enough of you, we'll just grab a bunch of us and a whiteboard and we'll explain it there. You can go to new members, or as we lovingly are trying to call it, Vision Quest. Not to make you a member, but to help you understand what's our vision. If we're going to ask you to be generous here, we should, we should tell you what we intend to do. That team that just got back from Haiti is going to have you on it soon. That missional person in your factory who's kind of awkward and tries to lead a Bible study is going to be you soon. That person who understands and knows the value of the people around them because Jesus Christ has communicated to you through a relationship with him, their value, that's going to be us. If you want to know more, just, just get invested where God's at work. There's three places God's working in this church, and it took me all of three seconds to write those out. Group 357, if you like to squeeze the trigger of a gun, smell the cordite in the air, and watch something explode, go to that and be part of the community. Go to Mind Break. Go to Blisters and run. I don't care. I just want you to be invested in the life of Christ going on within this body. Invest yourself in the life. Find where God's at work and join him in it. Just like Ruth found where the grain was being harvested and got to work in it, and God met her in that activity. I believe quite often we sit back and wonder, why doesn't God love me? It's not that he doesn't love you, but he's not going to spoon feed you. We're not babies. We're growing into the image of Christ. Third and final thing, leave something for the gleaners. Here's an invitation to have margins in your life. Have margins for those who might be in need of of just some of your time. Is anybody else here tired of being busy? Yeah, seriously, but we ask, how are you doing? I'm busy, praise God. It gives value to my being, right? I want to tell you something that's like a devastating report. I found out yesterday, I'm in my early 40s, I still call it that. I found out yesterday I'm pigeon-toed. I'm like, well, no. Well, look. Um, but, but my wife told me, she's like, yeah, you're pigeon-toed. I'm like, hold on. I didn't realize that was a thing for me. And she's telling me about this. She's seen it from the outside. Didn't hurt my feelings, but I was walking. I'm like, what's going on? My little pigs point in. I didn't get it. It kind of shocked me. But here's the reality. Some of us may think we're being great Christians and we think something's going on, but I will tell you from the outside, it can look very stale, it can look very religious, and it can look very lifeless. It can look very lifeless and you think you're fine, but you're not. Neither am I. We need to say enough busyness. Busyness is our pigeon toad here. We think it's value and we think it's this thing. I want to tell you, we need to get ourselves together and make margins for people like God did in Leviticus 23. For those who need some of your time, if someone asks you for your time today, would you be like, I have time in November right before I get the flu? (laughs) Do you want that? I promise we won't shake hands. I'll be a little clammy. Right? Most of us are scheduled out between football, baseball, track, gymnastics, guitar, piano, clarinet, whatever else. I don't know. Whatever else goes on. That's just the kids. Then there's work schedules and there's laundry and there's food and there's church. My goodness, now I have to volunteer and be in a sticky church? I don't need that happening. And you're going, I can't do it. That's because we have no margins. And God always creates margins for his people to respond to the world's need around them with the love of Christ. Make time for those who will need to discuss life's issues. You think, how do I have a discussion in this church? It's part of the vision we're, we're kind of unfolding. The sticky church is we're getting in people into smaller groups where those conversations come naturally. Second thing is make time for the margins for those who have no means to provide for themselves. I have been able to witness generosity on a blind uncaring scale. 
And I mean that in the positive sense. People who don't know other people and a need is called into the church. And I'll call somebody. I'll say, hey, you've told us if, if we have a need, I can call and see if you have anything. And they'll show up and they'll put money in our hand to give to somebody, no questions asked. Now, don't call next week and be like, I need a cheeseburger. That's not what we're talking about. <laughs> but I'm talking about people who give cheerfully and gleefully to make, make provision for those who couldn't get there. For somebody who got stretched too thin, they have a margin to bless other people. You should be giving and blessing other people and finally make margins for those who are afraid and without hope because believe it or not, you're not just Ruth in this story, you're also Boaz. You should be a refuge for the vulnerable, the oppressed, the broken, and the frightened. This church must understand that if we have margins, we will live the gospel out in ways that this culture will not understand, but they cannot resist it because it's the very love of Christ bleeding into the reality of this community. If we are going to be Christians, let us be Christians who are not owned by things in our heart, but we are owned by Christ. And let us be people who radically and generously and faithfully create margins to serve the world around us, just as Christ served us. My friends, for you, like me, the challenge is singular. What do we do with a gospel that doesn't say what you're doing is enough? The only way we do this is we, trans we are transformed by the power of Christ into his image, not ours. We're becoming like Jesus when we live, like his great, 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 how many times over grandparents. Ruth and Boaz, I said it last week, are the point at which the bloodline of Christ comes crystal clear. Because Boaz and Ruth have Obed, who has Jesse, who has King David, and the line to Christ is made clear. Here's my question. How many people will trace back the bloodline of Christ after they meet you? How many people will say, I have encountered the bloodline of Christ living among me in this town? If we live as people connected to this story, I believe this. The world will change and we won't be able to stop it. And it will change for the gospel changing better. Pray with me. Lord Jesus Christ, we love you. And we thank you for who you are. We thank you that we are not left to our own devices. We are not alone in this life, but we are invited to participate with you. So God, for courage, we ask for courage today to be people who live into your identity. For the courage to be generous with something that has owned our heart most of our lives. For the courage to be faithful with our time when it feels like we're already out of it. Lord, would you come and steal back from the devil what is yours, and it's our heart. Help us to be faithful, to be generous, to be in living praxis the very redeemer of the most vulnerable in our community, of those that are hurting and in need, but also those around us. Let us be an accountability measure. May our character carry us forward by the power of your spirit to be the living embodiment of you who we love, and you who's in name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends, please stand. Friends, my, my prayer, my challenge to you is simple. What owns you? What owns you today? Better question for us, the church. Who owns you? Who died that you might have new life? And whose life are you living? Because in the end, nothing we gain here can come with us. But the very thing we have been invited to will never leave us and will never depart us. It is the Spirit of God, the transforming Spirit of God that removes the shackles of the things in this life that own us and invites us into new life in Christ. And that is my challenge to you today. Be owned by him who first proved his love for you. Be owned by the one who by his shed blood you have been renamed. And then go live in close relationship with him. Whether you are thinned out or whether you're running flush, go live for him with all that you have because in the end, the one testimony we have, the one thing we have to take into eternity is our walk with Jesus Christ and our participation with him in the expansion of this kingdom. This gospel is yours to live. It's yours to live generously, freely, abundantly, and wildly abandoned to the one who has given you his name at very great price. And as you do, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In a world that knows so much chaos, so much war and so much hurt, may the peace of Christ 
be the badge we wear into that world. My friends, you are dismissed. Have a great day.